This is Greg Troutwine with Maritime Reporter TV, and we're very pleased to be joined today by Charles Good, the chairman of Cox Powertrain, to discuss the evolution and the future of this innovative diesel outboard engine brand. Charles, first and foremost, thank you for joining us. Uh, but if you could, to start us off, can you take us back a bit? When and why did the notion of a marine diesel outboard engine strike you as a good idea? Well, it's a pleasure to meet you and to know that you're a, a boating man as well, like me. Uh, so it makes having a conversation like this a whole lot easier because you understand the uh, basics. So to answer that question, we have to go back actually uh, to 1966 when I was 20 years old, believe it or not, um, in Gaios Harbour in Paxos in, in Greece, uh, when we were staying on my mother's uh, very ancient wooden Greek boat, a kaiki. And I was decanting petrol from a large container to a small one for our outboard motor and spilt a large quantity on the deck. Second later, it erupted into flames and a very serious fire ensued. Luckily, no one was hurt and we did contain the fire, but it was quite touch and go. And it's left an indelible mark uh, on my life after that. So that, that was really the initial instigation in the back of my mind that the somebody one day needs to come up with an outboard that uses diesel. Uh, you have it to hand on the boat, it's not dangerous. So I started this journey then uh, from a position of safety and single fuel convenience. I've read the company's history timeline, uh, but in your own words, can you? what do you consider to be the pivotal moment or relationship that made Cox Marine a go? Well, that's a really good question. So for 50 years, I felt a solution needed to be found for this. And the, the key uh, was looking at uh, marinized inboard engines. They were all uh, in the day lorry engines that were converted for marine use. And they're wonderful uh, engines, extremely long lived, uh, but they're very, very big and heavy. And so that was never ever gonna be an option for an outboard motor solution. And I waited, carrying on the rest of my career doing various things, uh, looking out for a, a technical solution to get the weight down on the engine. The key was to get the size of the engine down and the, the weight of the engine. That, that was where I started. And that happened uh, just over 10 years ago when I was introduced to David Cox. David um, had a career as an engineer, an outstanding a creative engineer with a background in Formula One racing over here in the UK. And he had been looking at designing a lightweight diesel for a completely different purpose, namely military drones, which um, didn't interest me at all. But I was very interested in his thinking behind uh, the work he was doing on how do you make a truly lightweight uh, diesel engine. Uh, and I spotted in that an opportunity to uh, look at the possibility of using this uh, creative thinking, uh, mainly driven from Formula One racing, uh, where there's a culture of driving engine power up and weight down, which could produce the result that we needed for an outboard motor. So that was when the dream, if you like, started to become a reality. Charles, when you look back at the company that you created in 2007, and the company that you see today. How is it the most the same and how is it most different? Okay, well, Cox is most the same as when we started uh, because of our ability to analyze technical challenges, work our way through them, resolve them effectively and deliver. So at the outset, we were entirely focused around how do we create a brand new diesel outboard competitive with gasoline outboards in the way they work, in the way you can use them, size and weight and so on. And that was a considerable challenge and we built up a large team of engineers in order to deliver on that. Uh, and by the way, in addition to, to just meeting that challenge, we've produced a, a growing list of patents, which is a strength to our business that we wish to continue in the future. So that is the same, that continues. Uh, no market stands still. We will have new products coming out, which we might chat about later, but um, so that, that is the same. The, the core of the business is technical ability to meet innovation. 
Where we're most different today is that we've transitioned in the last 18 months from being an early stage startup, effectively startup development business, to a full-blown manufacturer supplying product to a truly global market. This has involved a big shift in culture, skill sets in our organization, as well as the development of a number of commercial relationships around the globe on the supply side and even more extensively on the sales side through our distributors, which we've amassed across five continents. So the transition from a developer of technology to a manufacturer and seller of that technology globally. That's the migration we've been through. I'm sure there have been many hurdles to leap and stumbles along the way. Uh, when you look back, what do you count as the company's greatest challenge to get to where you are today? And how did you get over that challenge? Undoubtedly, the greatest single challenge was the power head. Um, getting the, the weight down, as I've mentioned already, the package size to something comparable with a petrol outboard. So all of the um, engines, whether you look in commercial vehicles or uh, marine inboards or um, even automotive, are still quite large when they're diesel compared to their petrol equivalents. And so that, that was the, the key factor that we had to overcome because it was essential for the product to become adopted by the market in our view that it should be effectively take your petrol outboard off the back of your boat put on a diesel flush out the fuel tank fill it with diesel and off you go it is more complicated than that of course in real life but conceptually we wanted the diesel outboard to be as interchangeable both in terms of installation and use as a, a gasoline outboard uh, and, and they're more complex uh, and that that was a, a big big challenge getting the weight out and the package size down meant looking at every single component from a blank sheet of paper and seeing how we could maintain its strength and uh, the, the purpose that whatever the component was was made for but to do it with a minimum weight and and this really came from our um, Formula One background and heritage from David and then others that we've had since. Um, and, and that is how we've dealt with it. It meant looking at every single part of the engine and, and looking at how we made it a smaller package and lighter. What is it about your new engine, the CXO 300, and today's decarbonization environment that tells you this is the engine of the future? I think that's a really good question. And there is no doubt that the market has already changed to some extent. Um, it certainly has an automotive big time. And aviation and marine are definitely looking at how best to decarbonize. What I will say is that I did a degree in physics. And I was given an option of a topic that I wanted to write about in my degree course. And I chose the application of hydrogen fuel cells for automotive in inner cities, because I'd been brought up in London through two huge smogs, which had killed tens of thousands of people through pollution. And I was very aware then, as a, as a young man or child, actually, in the first one, uh, how dangerous and nasty pollution can be. Uh, so I'm very conscious of that. And, and we at Cox are. Uh, I think it's all too easy to reading the headlines, forget that the, why diesel has become such a dominant uh, fuel source for marine and indeed in the automotive industry for many, many years until very recently. And that is that we save 25, 30% in terms of fuel. That means that the carbon dioxide emissions are similarly reduced by 25 to 30% versus gasoline. And we did a calculation a few years ago, uh, which told us that if we replaced, we or anyone else for that matter, replaced the petrol outboard um, fleet, if you like, global fleet of our sort of engine size, 250 horsepower upwards. Um, if the whole fleet was replaced, there would be annual savings of several million tons of carbon dioxide uh, every year. And that is really worth having. So I believe that um, a combination of that 
is a positive driver for us in terms of climate change. <clears throat> it's also true to say that the new emerging technologies are not there yet for marine. Uh, marine, you need to be able to go offshore, you need range. Um, so battery technology is at the moment not there. Um, hydrogen could be an answer, hydrogen fuel cells or other uh, means of using hydrogen. But truly green hydrogen is not yet available. So uh, to answer your question, which is a really good one, uh, we believe that this is a good solution for the moment to reduce emissions and that we have a pathway of at least two decades and probably three, but we're not going to sit on our hands. You know, we're going to carry on innovating and looking at what technologies could be used to further improve uh, our carbon footprint from our product. So let's fast track to today, if that's okay. Uh, can you give us a by the numbers look at Cox Marine using the metrics of your choice? Yes, I've just got a few for you. Um, they're not a huge number. Um, 10 years from first concept to reality, just over 10 years. 150 members of staff, 150 million pounds, nearly $200 million invested. Hundreds of engines already operational in 21 countries across five continents and 4,000 units per annum being the capacity of the existing production facility, which we have built in the UK. You've already discussed many of the hurdles that you've had to overcome. So perhaps this next question is repetitive, but it's taken a long time for the CXO 300 to get into production with the first unit just coming out in 2020. Simply put, what took so long? Well, personally, and looking back at it now, I don't think it actually has taken us very long. If you look at the cycle time for brand new products in other industries, they're typically five to 10 years uh, if it is a genuinely new product. Now throw in the fact we had to develop a totally new diesel engine layout, which has never been done before, one that with a vertical crankshaft. And then on top of that, throw in a global pandemic I don't think effectively 10 years from original inception and less than five since the base design was settled on is a very long time. What makes it seem a long time to many people and to me, I have to say, is that the market has been crying out for this, for a really great diesel outboard solution for so long, that once the market knew a solution was on its way, people got, understandably, very impatient to get their hands on it. So I think that's given the impression that it's taken perhaps longer than it should have done. But I think if you look across to other industries, maybe that's just a perception rather than a fact. So Charles, looking today, what are your monthly engine production rates and looking out a bit in the coming five years, how do you see that evolving? Okay, well, we're still at the back end of a pandemic. Uh, which has brought with it, as you know, uh, all, all, all manufacturing industries are suffering at the moment on the supply side, logistical problems, shortages of containers, bottlenecks all over the place. Um, so we, we have deliberately reined back production in the short term, partly because of those factors, but also because we want to walk before we run. Uh, to have time to bed down all our systems in the realities of the commercial world, so how we deal with our end customer and, and uh, the distributors and dealers. So at the moment, we're producing uh, 10 units a week. Our short-term plan is that this will gradually rise through the rest of this year to 40 a week. And then, of course, as the market evolves, our plan is to get to our target rate of production uh, from the existing facility of 80 to 90 units a week. So when you look at the world today, by geographic region, by market niche, or by both, where do you see the greatest opportunity in the coming years? We, we look at it um, from the point of view of coastline, uh, firstly and foremost. Um, Demand is going to come from countries with large coastlines. There are many of those. Um, the US, obviously, Canada, but there's a huge long list. The UK is surrounded by water. Uh, we're a very much a um, uh, maritime nation. Um, and so geographically, 
uh, the demand will come, we believe, and is already evidenced uh, from countries with long coastlines. And these are countries that have a requirement for what we would call commercial users and coast guards. So commercial users could be offshore installations, could be fishing, uh, could be all sorts of supply vessels. And indeed, the Coast Guard is an important market for um, all these countries. On top of that, we do think that high-end leisure, especially the super yacht market, will want to adopt diesel outboards simply because they don't want dual fuels on board and all the problems of decanting petrol that I encountered all those years ago. They have to do pretty much on a daily basis at the moment, uh, which is very frustrating. It's the worst job on the boat, I'm told, um, unless they're diesel inboard. And as you've pointed out earlier, diesel inboard has its own disadvantages in terms of layout and, and so on. So those are the principal markets. Um, so, uh, and anywhere with a long coastline is going to be where the demand is. So for viewers that are considering an outboard diesel engine, what do you consider as the main advantages? It depends on uh, what the uh, use case is, but the majority of our early adopters will be in the, what we would call the commercial segment, whether it's Coast Guard or other commercial operators, or indeed the high-end leisure market, typically super yachts, where the, these boats and engines get used a great deal. Um, and there, the, the principal um, uh, driver to adopt one of our engines is simply the fuel saving. We've got one customer who, who is a heavy user, who's already estimated, and these are their numbers, not ours, uh, an annual saving of $150,000 for each pair of COTS engines they are using versus gasoline. That's a huge payback. So there's an immediate financial benefit for anyone who's using uh, the engine a great deal. It is true the engines are more expensive uh, initially, but you get payback very, very quickly over months, not years. On top of that, for the wider market, you can uh, add substantial increase in range from the same size fuel tank, fuel safety, obviously, which I've touched on. Um, and I think also importantly, and um, particularly outside the US, is the ubiquitous availability of diesel on any part of the coastline where, where there, obviously there's human activity, um, which cannot be said of gasoline. Uh, in other parts of the world, uh, gasoline is actually quite difficult to get hold of um, uh, versus a diesel, which is used by everyone else on, on water, you know, large boats. Um, use diesel almost exclusively. So availability is, I think, another big driver for many, many people. I know that we can easily explore the technical specifications of the CXO 300 online, but can you take a moment and discuss what you see as the key technical attributes and parameters of the engine? Well, I think um, uh, the, 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 the key um, Numbers are you know, 300 horsepower. This is a big and powerful engine delivered at 4,000 RPM. It's a conservative, conservatively rated engine. Um, and we offer 479 foot-pounds of torque, which is a lot of torque for an engine of this size uh, and delivered over a very broad uh, rev range. Uh, so the engines give a lot of grunt at low revs, and you therefore should get um, very good hull shot performance, which is of interest to people who are driving a planing boat. Obviously, the 25 to 30 percent fuel savings versus gasoline. Um, we offer two gear ratios, so propping speeds of 2750 and 3200 RPM, uh, which is useful for different uh, use cases. We also offer a wide range of leg lengths, 25 inches, 30 inches, and 35. Not all the 300 horsepower petrol guys are offering three leg lengths, but we decided we wanted to cover pretty well every conceivable application that our engine might be wanted for. And I think you touched on it earlier. I mean, diesel and ours is designed to be the same as any other diesel in this respect has a long life. So we, we would anticipate our engines having 
three times the useful life of a petrol outboard. I think those are the, the key drivers. Just one more question. And I know that you're just starting the journey uh, with the engines in the market, but what's next for Cox Marine? It is early days for us. You, we've just launched our first product, um, but we will we'll undoubtedly look at, and we already are looking at, um, new product cycles yet to be announced. Uh, what we're doing is looking at the clearly um, the clear trends that exist in the premium petrol outboard market, uh, especially the move towards higher power. So when we first set out um, designing this engine, we, we went for 300 horsepower because at the time that was the largest petrol outboard. It's interesting that in the five years since we settled the design, the petrol outboard market has actually moved, as you know, quite a long way, uh, 450 being you know, reasonably commonplace um, last year, and now even 600 horsepower. So uh, th there's no doubt that we will be looking uh, at some point in the future, not too far away, at um, higher power outputs. Um, the core technology is absolutely as available to do this as any petrol outboard. And in the longer term, we'll continue to use our ability to innovate and resolve problems uh, to maximize customer experience and to meet the environmental challenges that do definitely lie ahead. So our purpose is that we're building Cox Powertrain to be a driver of positive change for the next five years, the next 10 and up to 50 years. We can't obviously predict much beyond 10 years and even that's difficult, but we, we intend for this to be the base of a business that is innovating and staying ahead for a long time to come.